we're giving away. All right. Is he ready? <laughs> this one's going to be interesting. I got a strange email from Evan yesterday. I have a high quality problem. And if you've ever talked to Evan, you go, what does this mean? Um, I got the opportunity to see this guy last year at DerbyCon. And uh, by the way, if, if uh, uh, just a, uh, a plug, uh, Adrian, raise your hand. Uh, Adrian Crenshaw and Dave Kennedy put on DerbyCon in Louisville. Um, I, I am not ashamed to say I stole a lot of ideas from them because these guys do it right. Um, DerbyCon does happen in September, so make sure to be there. Uh, the, the, our next keynote that's coming up is Evan Treefort Booth. Um, I'll just go ahead and give you his bio because it, I can't say anything better than this. Growing up, it was a safe bet that if an object was around the house, or, or, that an ob if an object around the house was held together with screws or contained num any number of wires, Evan Treefort Booth took it apart at some point to see what made it tick. In the fourth grade, with the help of strategically placed pins, erasers, and a Pop-Tart wrapper, <laughs> Evan's pencil box could quickly be converted into a model rocket launch pad. His liquid Drano purchases to toilet cleaned ratio is ab ab absolutely abysmal. This never-ending supply of curiosity eventually translated into a passion for understanding of computers and programming. Now, having earned a degree in digital media, a nerdy union of design fundamentals and computer programming from East Tennessee State University in Johnson City, Evan founded his company, Recursive Squirrel, where he has served a variety of clients in need of application development and consulting for nearly a decade. When he isn't organizing ones and zeros, Evan is likely picking off locks with fall, a fail association of lockpick enthusiasts, lock sport enthusiasts, the lock picking group he co-founded in 2010. In his most recent project, Terminal Cornucopia, Evan has set out to dis demonstrate how difficult it would be for an attacker to construct lethal weapons in a typical airport terminal after security screening. After successfully building an arsenal consisting of everything from simple melee weapons to reloadable firearms to remotely triggered incendiary suitcases, Terminal Cornucopia garnered an international media and attracted viewers from every single country. And as we found out last night, his, his website is now considered a domestic terrorist site. So that's a good sign of how much he does. Make no mistake, the best part about buying a bulky item is, in fact, the huge cardboard box. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Evan Shreefort Booth. Someone say, what? Do you have goggles? <laughs> What's that? Gotcha. Yeah, that'd be perfect. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Still alive, that's good. Okay, so I think we're actually starting this talk uh, about 10 minutes early, but let's just do this thing. All right.
And oh, this talk is Terminal Cornucopia. I appreciate you being here. Uh, this is actually a special edition of Terminal Cornucopia, where we will spend some time uh, demystifying MacGyver. Um, you guys look to be the appropriate age to have appreciated MacGyver for a while. Show of hands, MacGyver. Ah, oh, that is so, so nice. That's such a relief. I get, I get blank stares sometimes, and it makes me want to, want to harm people. Um, I'm Evan Booth. Um, there are a few things uh, here, a few ways to get a hold of me. Um, today we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about, and these things are, are two things that I'm, I'm like deeply fascinated with, uh, airport security and creative problem solving. But first, <clears throat> we've got this thing to take care of. Um, this is something I've been working on for a little while now, and um, I want to un unveil it today, and honestly, this thing is probably uh, a a better suited for a more of a workshop format, but we'll, we'll do it live. But um, this is the mullet run, and I actually have to put some of it back together real quick. But I'll try to talk about it while I do so. Um, the mullet run is a... Uh, a thing I put together because I wanted, I wanted a way to um, kind of test someone's creative and, and uh, resourceful abilities and do that in, a, in kind of a fun, very visual way. Um, and so you'll see in the mullet run uh, 15 little Lego flags of various colors. And the colors correspond to the, the um, difficulty required in, in capturing said flags. All right, so um, we've got a few special flags as well. So like the sword and the stone um, is worth 50 points. We've got one that uh, doubles your score. Let's see. Um, this one is, uh, I'm calling him Tufer because he, he's the guy that doubles your score. Um, this is the sword and the stone. It's kind of in, encased in uh, uh, Lego blocks. Aren't Legos fun? Uh, this is Timmy. Timmy is in the well. <clears throat> Hello, Timmy. Um, this is uh, Duke, the Duke, because it's a mayonnaise jar. Get it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we've got, uh, there's Timmy again. Um, got Batman hanging out. And uh, fantastic. So I'll set that up in a bit. Now, um, <clears throat> in the mullet run, when someone performs a mullet run, uh, the objective is to knock over as many of these flags as possible um, in, in three minutes. And they... They do so by controlling uh, one brave little robot. Isn't he cute? <laughs> hey, hey, buddy. So, um, uh, you know, if you guys have been on Earth for a while, you, you're familiar with um, like gravity and uh, you know some properties of materials and, and all that stuff. So you know that that you know you can't drive around and you know knock over a flag that's hanging upside down. So um, to remedy this, I want to give uh, two lucky contestants today um, one bag of stuff. And in this bag of stuff is a whole lot of macgyver things, right? Um, a personal cooling fan, uh, six rubber bands, a nine-volt battery, some plastic cutlery, some uh, paper clips, which are, you know, MacGyver special, aluminum ruler, uh, two copies of Sky Mall magazine. Take one. We'll, we'll replace it. Um, uh, three clippy cloppies. I don't know what those things are called, but they're clippy cloppies to me. Um, a little Nerf gun, and you could use your lanyard and your badge if you like. And at the end of the talk, after you MacGyver a solution to get as many flags as you can using this stuff, you'll have two minutes to um, set up you know, your contraptions on the mullet run course itself, and you'll have three minutes to capture as many flags as possible. Does that sound good? Have I missed anything humongous? All right, we'll just play it by ear. Um, it's a standard trigger, trigger remote, or pistol grip remote. Um, squeezing the trigger moves the car forward, and then the um, little knob uh, turns it left and right. And one really important thing to remember about this is that the uh, mullet run robot is built for precision, so um, it's not analog, or it's not digital, so it's not just like all or nothing. Um, if you just barely squeeze the trigger, it'll just creep forward. Uh, and that's probably the best way you should do uh, do this because um, even though I have added little you know guardrail things here and there, this guy is not around. Anyone know who this is? This is the guy that fishes you 
out of the, the gully when you fall off the track in Rainbow Road in Mario Kart. If you don't know that, then you're missing out on life. <clears throat> That's probably not true. I need two volunteers. You, sir. Who else? Going to be fun. You stand alone, my man. I don't know. Adventure, come on. Anybody else? All right. Excellent. There's one more thing I forgot to mention. This is a little thing I'm calling the mullet. It's going to sit on the robot when you do your run. Oh, here's this. You could actually work at your uh, at your tables. If that uh, let's go to you guys. Probably easier that way. Cool. Okay. So um, one thing that that just occurred to me the night before I actually flew down here is I just built this thing. Um, I might have some trouble flying with this, mostly because um, like it, it consists of like metal rods and microcontrollers and uh, a large PVC pipe with a wire running to it. <laughs> and um, you know, not even taking into account that, that I'm the one flying with it, <clears throat> I expected, I don't know, maybe for this thing to get opened up for someone to read around inside. But no, I got it in the lock was still locked, no note inside. Which means uh, one of two things is true. Um, one. Uh, I know nothing about the technology they use for imaging at the TSA, which must be pretty good. Or two, no one cares. But <laughs> uh, without further ado, let's talk about air airport security some. Um, last year, early last year, I started a project called Terminal Pornocopia. And in this project, I, I wanted to suss out one problem. And the problem was that I thought that, that you could take things you could purchase, anyone could purchase after security, after the security checkpoint, and build deadly weapons with those things. So in order to do this and make, make the research kind of valuable, I needed a couple very simple rules. Um, uh, number one, the only thing I could use are materials that are available after security. I have to walk in with nothing but cash and a small travel-approved multi-tool, which is this guy right here. So scissors, pliers, file, standard stuff. And three, anything you get yelled at for taking or messing with is off limits, which is kind of unfortunate because there's a lot of stuff they leave around at the airport. So I went to a, a, quite a few uh, airports to do this and um, found a lot of really interesting stuff. So let's talk about what I built. And this kind of takes place over the course of a year. And I started off with more simple like melee and, and simple projectile weapons and kind of um, got more advanced as I went along. So. Um, for this first build, I took magazines, Lady Liberty fridge magnets, Brady leather belts, scotch tape, and that got me the chucks of liberty. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Um, which I wouldn't like to get hit in the face with. I think you'll agree. Um, so let's see what, it, what, it'll do, <laughs> what the chucks of liberty will do to a coconut, yeah? It's me. And it's important to realize I chose a coconut because it it's a, was very unsci unscientifically, of course, probably a pretty good analog for a human skull, maybe a little harder. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Don't judge me. <laughs> Next, I took a hair dryer, compression st uh, socks, an umbrella, braided leather belts, some condoms, and that got Planned Parenthood. This is a sling bow, which is kind of a, an unholy um, matrimony between a, a slingshot and a bow and arrow. So um, what I'm doing here is I haul it out a hair dryer, and I'm using condoms as my elastic force. You laugh, you laugh now, but go braid some condoms together. It's hard. <laughs> Someone in here is like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Oh, man. And I'm shooting this, this shaft of a, a fiberglass umbrella. And fiberglass, if you've never messed with it, is the devil. Like, it just, it's like just, it's a, a, a whole colony of splinters that you can't see. They hurt. Let's test it out. All 
right, don't want to get hit in the face with that. Next, I took a robot gravity creepy uncle, a magazine, an umbrella, scotch tape, and some dental floss, a double wall tumbler, and a luggage handle, and made a dandy little crossbow. There's a better picture there. Oh, and the uh, collapsible luggage handle is my shoulder stock, my collapsible shoulder stock. <clears throat> uh, let's see. So using the ribs of an umbrella as, as my, um, my actual bow. Uh, dental floss, if you, you know, take about 10 strands of that, it's pretty much an unbreakable rope. You know, it's magic. Um, using just a, a bent piece of metal from a carry-on piece of luggage as a trigger, which uh, when twisted releases that key ring. And uh, here we go. Ouch. All right, so next I took magazines, braided leather belts, scotch tape, dental floss, the Constitution of the United States of America, <laughs> along with a Washington Monument pencil sharpener, which is just metal, sharp, awfulness. And that got me America. <laughs> the A is most definitely silent, um, which is a, a spiked club of of just, it weighs like eight pounds, it's awful. And you'd be really surprised what rolled up magazines and dental floss will do, especially when you, when you connect that with a um, sharp metal object. So let's try it out. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, America. All right, next I took a RC Jumbo Jet. Um, here's the insides of that. Uh, I took a lot of 9 volt batteries, a magnetic metal clip, scotch tape, and dental floss, and made this. What is that? That's actually a, a, a remotely triggered mechanical relay. So, um, what I'm doing here is I'm using um, mechanical energy or me mechanical force to close a, a high current circuit. Um, so, basically, in this particular example, I'm using the motor from the airplane, and when I hit the trigger, it spools up pulls up the dental floss, pulls a non-conductive piece of whatever out of the way, which allows that magnet to you know, clamp shut, closing the circuit. Um, so when you have a, a large circuit, like maybe 72 volts, you chain, chain nine volts together, um, and you run, that, you run that current through a very thin wire, let's say like a spring from a lighter or a coil from a hair dryer, uh, it gets super hot really fast. So um, to test this, I ran that coil up through a Zippo, like that, and um, kind of laid, it, laid everything out, and I'm, I'm just uh, seeing how quickly I could start a fire um, remotely, like this. Oops, my bad. So it doesn't take very long. So now that, now that I've got this, this um, bit of, um, it's not really a weapon, it's more, more of a utility, um, I, I built the parting gifts from a grouchy man. <clears throat> and basically what this was is a suitcase, and I wanted to be able to hit this trigger and make this thing burst into flames, right? And so the, the trouble with starting a fire inside a suitcase is that you don't get a lot of air you know, inside a suitcase. So what I did is I took a fan from a hairdryer and just jammed it in the side. <laughs> which worked out pretty nice, actually. Um, this is pretty simple. I took uh, the, the electro-mechanical um, uh, relay and um, had a 9-volt to power the fan from the battery and a, a bank of 9 volts to uh, run through a thin wire to start the fire. And then I just added flammable stuff, you know? <clears throat> and in the lid of the suitcase, I added some of this stuff, all of which you could purchase at an airport. Um, and the video is pretty long, and I've got a lot to cover, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a hint. It burst into flames and started exploding. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> so that, that, worked, that worked quite well. Um, the next thing I, I discovered that was um, substantial to this research was um, that you could, you could get lithium metal inside airports. And you get this inside uh, lithium metal batteries. Like, um, Energizer makes the most popular kind. And I don't know if you guys have, like, 
what I did in chemistry is I, I wrote Pong on my TI-89. Can I get an amen or something? Come on. <laughs> Any, okay. Um, so I didn't really remember this, but if you mix lithium with water, it creates an exothermic reaction. It's very strong. It puts off hydrogen gas and a lot of heat. Um, and so this, here's a simple test. This is, this is like a condom full of water. I wrapped a um, you know, metal wire around it, and then in the bottom of this frappuccino glass, I have some lithium metal. And uh, once I close the circuit, um, the wire heats up, condom bursts, water gets introduced to the lithium metal, and just watch what happens. It's bad news, right? So knowing this, I, I, built a, I built a weapon called, oh, the slow-mo. I forget every time. That's awesome. Should be chariots of fire playing, right? Oh, it's glorious. OK, so knowing this, I, I built a weapon called the Blunder Business Class. And what this is, is a, a break action uh, reloadable shotgun. Uh, essentially, it's the same, the same technology I'm using. I'm using a, a bank of nine volts, and I'm uh, running that through a, a very uh, thin piece of metal. And uh, oh, let, me, let me show you this real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So there's that, that thin piece of metal that heats up. Now it actually lines up with the very bottom of the shell, which has a small hole in it. Now directly above that, there is a condom with about an ounce of water in it. And above that, I've got an axe, one ounce axe body spray can that I've, I've usually I wrap this in lithium metal. That tends to work really well. Um, and above that, I've got some padding or wadding. And then above that, I've got uh, my actual payload. So um, what happens is that uh, thing heats up, condom bursts, the water mixes with lithium metal, and all hell breaks loose. So let's watch this. I'm shooting a dollar and 33 cent with a pocket chain at some drywall. And slow motion. So it was very effective. Um, the muzzle velocity was about that of a, of a 22, or not the velocity, but the muzzle, the muzzle energy was about that of a 22. Um, the next thing I did is I, I looked at um, something a little more effective as a projectile than pocket change. It's not the most aerodynamic thing. Um, and so I found these, these uh, pewter spoons, the collectible spoons. You, you guys have seen these, yeah? Um, and I don't know if you guys are, are like fans of the Civil War, and like, you know, where they used to use these uh, as, as like, you know, actual um, rounds, um, but pewter has a very low melting point. So um, knowing this, uh, I made a, a very um, simple mold from aluminum cans and scotch tape and a little dental floss, and I uh, applied some heat to this with uh, a lighter and um, a can of Axe body spray. <laughs> Doing this, sorry. Every time I pull my pants up. One more time. Of course you have to temper your final product. That's about standards, right? There we go. 
So once I unrolled that, I ended up with this, which is pretty, pretty god awful. Um, trim that down a little bit, and I wanted to figure out a, a way to shoot this thing um, and, and not lose a lot of energy in the process. Because obviously, with a, you know the shotgun, the blunder business class, there's a lot of energy wasted everywhere, all over your face, you know, your arms, your arm hair is gone. It's awful. Um, so I, I wanted to make something a little more controlled. Uh, so I started with this, and I took this. <laughs> Actually, just the uh, little uh, metal tube from this. Fed that through the, the top, uh, reinforced that with some magazines, and ended up with something like this. Uh, here's a different view. And uh, inside, you know, a, a lot of the, the same things are going on that, that um, were used in the Blunder business class. This is obviously a single shot. Um, idea being that um, this metal container is going to contain the explosion, send all that force down the barrel, and of course send our projectile flying at a very, very high rate. I've got my target, and safety first, people. Come on. So let's see what happens. Yes, it is. So anyone see what happened? There's my bullet right there. I forgot to put it in. <laughs> Man, that blew my mind. I was like, what happened? And then I was like, oh. <laughs> oh, man. OK, so I tried again. <laughs> oh. oh, every time I pull my pants up. So anyway, OK, I'll, I'll skip to the next, uh, next video. Actually, I did. Uh, Hang on, we got we got a it's slow motion over here. Test. Oh, wait, wait, real quick. I actually did find a reliable, you know, more controlled way of shooting this. Oh, wait, there's ultra slow mo. Sorry, I forgot about that. That's just lithium metal exploding, by the way. That's kind of cool. Um, I did find a reliable way to shoot this. This is pretty nasty. But I haven't found a reliable way to, to trigger that, that reaction just yet. But. Still working on that. So, okay, coming off the heels of this, I, I thought, you know what? I'll just make an explosive. That's a lot easier. I seem to be doing that anyways. So then I made, uh, I made the Fragacino. <laughs> you guys are clapping. It's like, hey, failure, yeah. It's like, this is like a bunt, you know? Uh, what I did was I took a, a glass ornament. And yes, you can buy those in, inside airports, um, mostly like, you know, like sports, like sports team. You still buy them like this time of year. I don't understand it. Um, filled it with water and then put uh, uh, chewed chewing gum on the little hole part. And I actually found out later that like you could replace all that a lot easier with a snow globe. <laughs> Just put a snow globe in there. Um, and the usual suspects, you have lithium metal in your Axe body spray. And um, I super glued the lid on just to contain it just a little bit longer. And in this video, I, I you know, slam it down on a cinder block to break the ornament and chuck it. Perhaps the most frightening thing about these, these in particular, is uh, they take about seven minutes to make start to finish. Which is not a whole lot of time. Especially if you have a two hour layover. How many can you make? I don't know, a dozen or so. So, um, next weapon, um, I actually. I, there's always slow motion evidence.
cool. So the next, the next weapon I actually built for um, Wired UK, and uh, the, they did a piece on terminal cornucopia, which is actually out in, in this month's uh, edition, which is June. Um, and I, I built this, uh, who's played Assassin's Creed in here? Everybody loves the, the hidden blade, yeah? So I, I wanted to build that. And I, I did that with a retractable luggage handle, some uh, rubber bands, some dental floss, magazines, obviously. This is like the, the most NASCAR uh, thing I've ever built. Um, and then some braided leather belts. And I uh, ended up with something pretty cool, I think. Pretty nasty. All right, so in conclusion, yes, an attacker can build deadly weapons using items available for purchase inside an airport terminal. Yes, very yes, all of my yes. <clears throat> so I did, a, I did a lot of talking about, about this particular subject um, uh, last year, and a, a question that came up almost always was this. How do you come up with this stuff? Um, and to me, like, this stuff, I, you know, I, I, I think I come up with it naturally because I really enjoy doing it. But um, I didn't want to take some time and answer that question. So. That brings us to the second, the second topic, and that is creative problem solving. And we're going to talk about this uh, through the context of the man, freaking Angus MacGyver, who's holding a missile. <laughs> Don't argue with him. Um, and he has a superpower, right? You put him in any situation, and he can figure it out. He can work it out, and, and he does it with just the stuff around him, right? It's amazing. Uh, so let's talk about that. How, how does he do it? So he could take this, basically, and diffuse this. So that, that's, there's quite a jump there from point A to point B. So let's break it down a little bit. Of course, we're talking about creative problem solving. Um, and just to note, like problem in this obviously has a neutral connotation. It's more like the, the problem that a particular product solves. Um, and I think that, that creative problem solving kind of has four, four main components. Um, one's knowledge, experience, preparation, and of course, good old fashioned creativity. So let's talk about knowledge. Um, Excuse me, as I was working through Terminal Cornucopia, I found that it's very useful to think about problems um, as a collection of forces. So what do I mean by that? It's basically removing the smoke and mirrors from, from you know, the task at hand, from the system at hand, what you're looking at. Um, it's probably best to work through some examples. So what am I talking about when I say, uh, gravity pushes water in a reservoir through a one-way valve into an aluminum tube where the water is heated until boiling by electric current running through metal coils, which forces the water up through a thin tube before being sprayed evenly onto a perforated container. What is that? That is every coffee maker you've, you've used since the 50s, right? This one's a little harder. Good job, by the way. Who, who said that? Who was that? Awesome. Try to, get, try to get this one. A momentary switch on a peripheral closes an electric circuit, which causes a trigger to be sent to a display, which immediately filled, is immediately filled with solid black, followed by white squares and key locations, which in turn are read by a phototransistor on the peripheral. More specific. A Nintendo zapper. Jing, jing, jing. You all hear it. You guys didn't know it. Never mind. Okay, so um, this one's easier. A water and ammonium nitrate mix to create an endothermic reaction when the container separating the water from the ammonium nitrate is ruptured. What was that? Close. Cold pack. Had I said exothermic, then it would have been a, you know. But yeah, this, you guys are on it. I like it. So, so how does MacGyver use this, right? Um, he could look at this, and because he knows, he knows the, the forces at work inside of a hair dryer, he knows that electric current you know, heats up the coils, and um, the electric current is, is causing a fan to spin, <clears throat> moving air over the coils. He knows that uh, this is inside, right? And he's able to use this information to ultimately diffuse this. So there's, there's a couple ways you could do this, right? So knowing what's inside a hair dryer, you could either maintain a working knowledge of basically everything ever, or just keep your phone handy. <laughs> but we'll talk more about that later. Um, so yeah, knowledge. It's very simple. Uh, the next thing is experience. And, um, and this is humongous. So like, you know, I, I think I could spend a, you know, a couple days locked away and um, do a lot of Googling and spend a lot of time on YouTube and like, figure out how to neuter a cat and like, do that. I think I could do that, right? But in, until I do that, actually do it, like, that knowledge is basically worthless. So 
Um, experience does a few things for us. Uh, one small thing is it improves our dexterity. Um, also allows us to gain a familiarity with the tools. And uh, more importantly, it teaches us how to troubleshoot, right? It teaches us how to fail, uh, which is very important when you're neutering a cat to know how to troubleshoot. I would, I would imagine. I've never done that. I've never done that. Um, but experience doesn't always have to be hands-on. Uh, a quick story for you. So um, when I was younger, my brother and I would spend our summers in rural Kentucky. And um, I don't know if you guys have been out to rural Kentucky. Uh, they have this, this interesting uh, uh, phenomenon there. Where people, when they're done with their stuff, they just sort of like put it outside. Um, and it's pretty cool. It's like a museum mixed with Cracker Barrel, mixed with a yard sale. Nothing's for sale. And if you try to try to like look around and stuff, people will shoot you. Um, but what I would do is, is my grandpa, he had a Christmas tree farm, and um, when he would get back home every day, my brother and I would pile in the back of the truck, and we would drive to a, you know, like a local grocery store, and we would get an ALA, which is Kentucky's, like, soft drink. It's amazing. It's a secret family recipe. You should try one. Um, on the way, in this, you know, 10, 15 minute drive, I would imagine, like, you know, me running beside the truck really fast and rummaging through all this crap in people's yards. And I would find a, you know, a hose here and a, you know, an axle from a truck and, you know, a piece of wood here. And I would try to build things in my mind. So, you know, I kind of have a challenge every day. So today I want to build a helicopter or a glider or, a, you know, a, a gas powered pogo stick or something like that. And, you know, I would do this for a summer. And it was interesting because kind of at the end, like, I, I felt like I was actually getting better. Like some days when I'd arrive at my destination and drink my L8, I would be like, yeah, you know, I felt like I came up with something pretty clever today. Um, but yeah, it, it doesn't always have to be hands-on. Like, I, I think you could, you could um, let your mind work through some problems like that. So I would challenge you next time you're in either of these locations, um, spending some time in there, um, imagine that in an hour, the whole place is going to flood with piranha-infested water. Or uh, a, a dozen ninjas are going to descend on this building. You have an hour, and you've got this stuff around you. What do you build to keep yourself safe? What do you do? in that hour, and then like walk around and give yourself some leeway and some flexibility. And, um, it doesn't always have to be perfect or work you know, perfectly or be perfectly plausible, but it's a lot of fun, a little way to pass time. So MacGyver, how does he use experience, right? He could look at this, he has a knowledge of the systems at, 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 at play here, so he, he sees this, and he knows that he could take this and then shim his way out of handcuffs behind his back because he's got experience working behind his back. And eventually diffuse this, of course. So um, the next thing is preparation. And so what is, what is like the one thing that MacGyver always had on him all the time? Tube socks, you're right. Exactly. <laughs> no, you got it. It's got, he always has his, had his pocket, <clears throat> his pocket knife on him. And of course, if we're going to be as, as like cool as MacGyver, we might need this, <laughs> um, which actually has like like musical instruments on it, and uh, one of these things just like the button it releases glitter. It's pretty cool. Um, this blade here, this this glows blue, and orcs are present. Um, and this actually, this blade is just like gold for whatever. I think they got bored. We'll put a gold blade in there. What's that? That's real, yeah, absolutely. It costs a fortune. Um, but anyways, um, preparation. I, I think the, the one of the, the most most fun thing we could do. On this theme is to sit and, and like take a take a sec to re reevaluate our daily carry, and so like, what does that mean? So basically, like, there's stuff that you and this is wildly different for for uh, males and females, obviously because of the purse factor, but there's a, a certain you know spattering of things that you put on your on your person every single day. So lay all that stuff out and then look at the capabilities of of those things and think about well, what would I like to be able to do, you know, and then think about modifications you can make. Uh, someone actually showed me this uh, the other day. Um, who, who in here is a uh, Redditor? Who likes Reddit? That's good. A few people. Um, there's a really cool subreddit called EDC, which is Everyday Carry. And basically, people post pictures of um, you know, all their stuff laid out, stuff they carry every day, and um, along with that, the, um, you know, their age and their profession, which is pretty neat. So MacGyver, right? He can look at this, he sees this, because he has that knowledge, and then he used this to extract a ceramic plate, which he knows will break tempered glass. So he breaks that glass, and he's able to escape, and eventually go find and defuse this. And he, he can do that because he's prepared. 
So next, let's talk about creativity. And this is something that I've, I'm certainly not an expert at, but I, I really enjoy it. Uh, and a lot of people, when I, when I talk about creativity, they shut down and they say, yeah, I'm not creative. Um, but I've got good news. Yes, you are. And it's really not even your fault. You see, there's this area of your brain um, called the erratus congia. And it's actually looking at the scans. It's, um, it's pretty big. Hang on. That actually, I think that's wrong. Yeah, yeah, erratus congia is, uh, that's actually Latin for uh, angry shoelaces. And uh, this section here, that's actually just Christopher Walken. <coughs> uh, luckily, we're not going to talk about the brain because I don't know anything about it, obviously. Um, but I think it's a lot simpler than that. So let's take a different approach. Who in here dreams? Everybody does. Okay, so in your dreams, it's usually you, and you're hanging out. You're at your desk, and you know, you're getting some work done, and you're having a good day, and your boss comes in, and it's like, all right, Johnson, you're doing great. You're an asset to the team. It's fantastic. And then you wake up, and it's like, yeah, that was great. Now I'll get to go do it in real life, right? That's what dreams are like. Of course not. No, in your dreams, your desk becomes a bear with a tie. And that's okay, because you're going to ride your desk bear and shoot your gun that sprays Wikipedia, right? <laughs> Which is all good until your teeth fall out and you get penciled. <clears throat> I hate it when that happens. Right, those are dreams, right? Why is that? That's because everyone is creative. We have the ability to create those things, whether we like it or not. And uh, our sleep proves that. Everyone has the necessary hardware. Everyone's got that erat erratus congia, right? <laughs> Uh, so when we sleep, our brains are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we wake up, and they're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm out of here. And I stole your TV and your head and your VGA cable. <clears throat> What's the problem here? It's obviously us, right? So at night, our brains are you know, exploring and having fun and, and you know, doing things we would never dream of. <laughs> but, uh, and we wake up and it's just like, wait a second. Hold up, hold up. This doesn't make any sense. We, we can't have this. You know, I'm the law. Why do we do this? I, you know, there are a few reasons for that. Um, you know, a big one is fear and shame. Very simple. So when we our task with expressing creativity, um, you know, we always run the risk of, of someone hearing our ideas and thinking that they're stupid, right? Or even worse, hearing our ideas and then thinking that we're stupid, which uh, is unfortunate. Or it works in reverse, too. Let's say you do get a good idea. Now you're afraid that you're going to be called on to execute on it, right? Or let's say you had a good idea last week. Oh, great. Now I'm the good idea guy. So I got I to gotta deliver again this week. So I think fear and shame play a lot into that. Uh, another is just pragmatism. Uh, so what do I mean by this? So I think a lot of people, because they're kind of like, you know, everything has to, has to come up with a, a, you know, a practical, tangible solution, right? When they, when they stop to think about and brainstorm about an issue that requires a creative solution, they feel like they have to emerge with this, you know, glorious solution that, you know, they can execute on immediately. But it doesn't really work that way, um, just in my experience. So I like to think of ideas as more of the raw material rather than the finished product. So a quick example of this is um, take uh, skipping a stone, right? There's a lot of components to skipping a stone. You have to know some like fluid dynamics and you know how a, sk a stone acts when it hits water at a certain angle, right? You, who has skipped a stone in here? Everybody? Oh, most everybody. That's good. Um, you have to know uh, you know how to hold it, how to stand, <laughs> what to wear, obviously. Um, and then you know you know you have to know like what body of water to look for. Is it you know it needs to be still enough? You need to have enough room. A lot of people look at ideas as like this whole picture, right? Throwing the stone and skipping and all this stuff. But really, ideas are the stones. The more you have, the more likely you are to find one that's absolutely perfect for skipping. And you may have to go through a lot of stones to get one, you know, but that's okay, because stones are useful for all sorts of other things. <clears throat> I've officially run that analogy too far. Um, next thing is projection, and that is simply mistaking the execution of someone else's creativity for creativity itself. So like, you know, man, did you see Bob made a cake? It's in the break room. It's ridiculous. It's got like, you know, a fountain on it. How does that work? It's like chocolate everywhere. Nessie swimming in it. It's amazing. I could never do that. I'm not creative. Or, um, you know, Steve built this file system for, for, you know, storing all these files. And like, the way he did it's brilliant. Like, I, I, 
you know, I'm not creative. I could never do that. That's not a creative person. But that's, you know, that's a mistake in execution for creativity. A lot of people do that. Uh, another huge one is distractions, right? Um, this is getting harder and harder as technology gets more in our face. Uh, and I, I'm definitely, uh, definitely um, guilty of this as well. But you know, John Cleese of Monty Python fame talks a lot about creativity. He describes it as a flow, something you have to work into, and something you can't, you can't enter into and, and expect to be reasonably, reasonably successful at unless you carve out two things, some space and some time dedicated just for, just for letting your brain roam a bit. So you've heard people say that I get my best ideas in the shower, right? I mean, maybe there's some truth to that. I mean, you're, you're standing in a, a, a very small room looking at a blank wall that's three feet in front of you. You're doing these motions that you've done hopefully every, every day, every other day-ish, <laughs> you know, since you were able to move your arms. Who does this? That's, what is that? Um, and then your brain is just like, dude, this, this channel sucks. Change it. Like, let's go think about some stuff. So I certainly think about the most crazy things in the shower. So um, that's, that's wildly important. And this is our superpower, right? You know, I'm a technology guy, and in all the advances we've had in artificial intelligence and uh, you know, quantum computing in the last 30 years, like we've yet to build something that can string together thoughts and have an epiphany. Like, that's important. We could, we could walk into a room with nothing at all, and given a little time, emerge with like very, very complex solutions to, to amazingly difficult problems. Like that's our superpower. And I think I think a lot of things get in the way of that. Another is necessity, and that's simply that you know my, my job doesn't create you know require creativity. Like you've heard people say this, yeah. So I mean, if you really think about it, jobs are what they are you know procedures and. Um, uh, yeah, procedures that, that basically someone had to come up with and create at some point, someone who cared enough about the profession. So, you know, if you, if you don't like the way your, you know, your job is done or think it can be done better, that's a freebie. Fix it. <clears throat> cool. So, necessity. Let's talk about a few things that we can do that will help us to, to naturally think creatively. One, uh, and this is huge, realize that, that right now you know absolutely everything. And what do I mean by this? I, I, the colors are significant here. Um, maybe 20 years ago, if I were to say, you know, what's the capital of, uh, you know, Idaho? You know, like maybe maybe a job or some profession or something like that would be important to know offhand. But like, who doesn't know that these days? No one at all, because we all have smartphones that are like in our pockets. We can just find that information immediately. Um, so. I think one of the most valuable skills for people going into the workplace or, or even in, in a, a school environment these days is how to search for and vet relevant information. Um, and this is, this is very important. So a couple of quick examples. So like I typically do like a Photoshop of the day. And so um, I'll go, this actually is not relevant, but I want to show you. Um, <clears throat> like I'll you know, troll Facebook and find a photo and get inspired and like end up with something like this. This is a great, this is a very fun exercise. But uh, a, a more, uh, a, good, a better example would be um, like back in, in my PC gaming days. And this is a long time ago when Quake One was out. Um, I would you know fiddle around with mods, and I found um, a mod for Quake One. You know, and I was amazed by this because you could change the way the game works. You know, just by you know I, like someone someone who isn't the original developer could could modify this thing. It's pretty awesome. So I wanted to know how to do this. So I um, of course I got online. Wow. Maybe mom's on the other line, darn it. Okay, there we go, fantastic. So I, I search engined um, how to build mods in Quake and found Quake C, which is kind of like the C-like language for compiling mods specifically for Quake. Printed out the manual, it's fantastic, and I learned that, and I was 14 years old. And um, this particular thing, and, and some things like it, like literally shaped the trajectory of my career, and this was 1996. So in 2014, Everyone knows everything, like like knowledge or, or how to do something. Like that's that's no longer a, a valid barrier to entry. If you want to learn something or try something new, like you know how to do it. Maybe not now, but you know, give yourself a few minutes on your phone or your computer, and you will. <clears throat> Number two, 
um, and this is very, very uh, uh, related to the number one. Find what you love doing and do it. And I'm about, I'm about to blow your mind. You ready? If you weigh 99 pounds and you eat a pound of nachos, you are now 1% nachos. I'm just kidding, but that's true. But that wasn't what I was going to say. Um, I'm a little medicated right now. I've got a sinus infection, so that, that stuff happens. Um, <laughs> no, like you could very well be the best person on earth at, at a given thing, just haven't found it yet. So find it, right? <laughs> I think we're designed to be passionate about things. And Let's say, let's say there's, you have a, a, a very quiet song in your heart, and you've always been fascinated with, like, a crazy example would be, like, let's take pottery, something that, you know, I don't know, it's kind of, kind of an obscure thing. Um, but you've always, been, you've always been interested in it, never really done it, because it doesn't really make sense for you to do it. Um, but you should definitely try that out, because you could very well, like, that could be your thing. Like, everyone needs that thing. And just remember that you know everything. So if you have been waiting to get into something or try something new, um, just go on YouTube. <laughs> or there's actually no excuse list.com, where literally it's just like, what do you want to learn? And you type it in, and it gives you a list of resources. Or seriously, just Google anything. Seriously. Um, find what you love doing and do it. And a lot, of people, a lot of people mistake this for their profession. And they're like, well, you know, I'm you know, a network engineer, or a pen tester. I, you know, I love doing it cool, and all this stuff, you know, that, that, might, that might not be it. And you might be good at that, and, you know, it might pay bills and be very practical. But, like, for the sake of humanity, <laughs> it is it's not good enough for, for us to do the same crap, like, day in and day out, simply because we're capable of doing the work. We have to be passionate about what we do. Otherwise, we're just doing it. We're not moving the ball forward. So, <clears throat> sorry, a little preachy, but number three. When you're starting to think creatively, start small, you know? Don't, don't leave here and be like, I'm going to, you know, volunteer to make the new logo for my company or anything like that. Like, you could start small. It's okay. So, like, for example, the next time that you, um, next time you put, on, put on a tie or, you know, fill out a bank statement or a, a deposit slip, or the next time you, you know, address your colleagues for 10 minutes in your weekly status, or the next time you introduce yourself to someone or... Um, and the next time you set the table, like, make that your opportunity to think creatively about how to do that. You know, let your, let your mind, you know, wander a little bit. And make that, make that your own thing. You know, because no one cares how you do stuff like, small stuff like that. No one cares how you put your tie on. You know, who, who cares how you set the table? But you could, you can enjoy that stuff. And, um, you'll find that once you feel a little more comfortable working through some of the smaller things creatively, once those bigger problems come along, that won't be completely unfamiliar territory. So number four, be prepared to fail gloriously. And this is huge. Like, I, I cannot tell you how, what, what percentage of, like, my work on terminal cornucopia was just failure and, like, dis, like rhythmic, beautiful failure. Like, in, that's just part of, the, it's part of the process. So remember that when you're, when you're trying to find things that you're passionate about doing. Um, that's going to be part of the process. And I know you're probably thinking, well, I'm kind of old, you know? I can't, uh, I can't go off and like, try pottery. People are going to think I'm weird. So there's a solution to that, right? Be a secret agent. <laughs> so basically, like, start doing things that if you were to have done them as a kid, like, you, you would have put you in therapy for. You know, like, keep a journal and hide it somewhere, you know? <laughs> um, make, a, make a secret stash in your house. And when you do try that pottery out, make an ashtray for the first time, keep that. Or the next time you get a crazy idea in the shower, write it down. And so you can come back to that and iterate on that idea later. Um, but make it, keep it a secret, you know, yeah. And, and worst case scenario is you're, you know, you die and your kids find this and like, they think you're awesome and then like you're popular on Reddit for about 15 minutes. So jumping back to the man who's apparently shooting like fire out of his fingertips, I missed this episode I think. Um, he's able to look at this, has the knowledge required to, to really see this, can use this to 
get those, get those handcuffs behind his back. He's got his knife on him so he could extract the ceramic plate to you know, shatter that tempered glass, locate the bomb, and well, <laughs> it'll probably go off. Because the thing about MacGyver that's not very realistic, and um, one of many, is that you don't get it right the first time. So be prepared to fail gloriously. That's perfectly OK. So while we are getting our two glorious contestants to come forward, um, I'll take questions. So yeah, you would think so. Not so much. Um, you know, I called the TSA when I first started the project, and I was like, look, this is what I'm doing. And they were like, OK. Um, and I said, I, I'm going to, um, um, you know, I'm going to let you know what I find, certainly. And cool. And that was it. And so I did that. And I sent about five reports over the course of 14 months and did not hear back a single time. So that wasn't completely unexpected. But um, yeah, I've never been like selected for special screening. Or I haven't gotten so much as a sideways glance in an airport. I mean, outside of like just normal, normal screening stuff. So I did get a visit from the FBI. But they were just coming to ask me some questions. And it was very friendly. <laughs> well, there's, there's something about uh, um, asking forgiveness and permission or something like that. Um, <laughs> whether I tested in a field or my garage is mostly a function of um, whether I had access to the field and whether I had time to make it out there. Um, in some cases, like, like probably shouldn't do anything like that in your garage. I said probably. You shouldn't do that like anything like that in your garage. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, we'll talk later. <laughs> Anybody else? Cool, all right, let's try this out. How long is this thing? I gotta set this up really fast. Awesome. Yeah. I think we're good. Uh, about a week, I guess. Awesome. OK. Beautiful. And all right, so that's, that is the score. Should be working, yeah? Yeah. Pretty cute.
Okay, so if you're ready, um, I've got two minutes on the clock here. Yeah, to set up whatever you want here. Yeah, that's in your, in your three minute run, yeah. You'll just be driving the car. You ready? All right, and go. Yeah, actually, the the back is. Ah, this is the back. Yep. How many of you guys are from St. Louis? Dang. How about those Lewis and Clark guys, man? What should I do while I'm here? Is it one of those things where I'm going to be like, yeah, okay, I'm hungry. How far away is the zoo? Okay. Oh, what's that? What is that? Oh, nice. Oh, that's cool. Hmm. Oh, so... Let me introduce you guys real quick. Um, my three-month-old daughter is here, and she's in the back. And there's my wife holding her, and she's sleeping. So, shh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Is that awkward? Huh? Awkward? Huh? <laughs> Ten seconds. Okay. Cool. All right, that's time. So let me put three minutes on the clock. Oh, you'll be fine. Uh, let's see. That'll work. And here's this. Start here? Yep. You ready? Would it be weird if I asked you guys to clap? Yeah, this guy. And go. You might need to go around. You might need to go around that thing. I think your joust is causing you problems.
<laughs> Gloriously. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that is time. <laughs> All right, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Oh, okay. Ah, eh, clippy clappies. All right. So, two minutes on the clock. You ready? And go. Five seconds. Twenty seconds. You ready to go? All right, one sec. All right, and go.
Oh, Bill, do you want one to tell him? Take it back out. Oh, holy crap. <laughs> Oh, oh you, you got to cut the tread off. <laughs> I forgot to mention that's worth 10 points. <laughs> All right, right. <laughs> cool. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right, and thank you guys for coming. It's been fun. Now go eat some stuff, I guess. Mm -hmm.